It is really a uh, great honor and my pleasure to introduce to you Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Salatu wa salamu ala sharaf al wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahabatihi wa min tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen. اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزلنا علما وصلي اللهم على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم نعم الله the merciful the compassionate I want to start off by saying that I know next to nothing about جلال الدين الرومي so I'm not going to talk about uh, Maulana Rumi. I've, I've read his poetry in translation and the Methanawi several years ago from Nicholson's uh, translation. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about was words and in particular about poetry, uh, which I do know a little bit about. And uh, the reason for that is twofold. Uh, one, in terms of the English language, I don't know anybody that knows English poetry better than my father does. Uh, he was uh, somebody who, as far as I can tell, uh, had a religious experience at Columbia University, uh, taking classes with a man called Mark Van Doren, who was also one of the teachers of uh, John Berryman, who some of you might know who was an expert on Shakespeare. Van Doren was a teacher uh, of literature. He taught the great literature of Western civilization. And my father uh, sat in his classes for three years at Columbia University and then audited his classes after he'd finished all the courses that he could take with him. And I don't think he ever said anything in any of his classes, but he he told me many stories, and he actually he named me after uh, Mark Van Doren. Uh, so that tells you I was his first, firstborn son, and I think that tells you the impact that this man had on his life. But one of the things that he said about Van Doren that struck him uh, as to his teaching technique is he said, unlike the other professors at Columbia University who would always look at the masters with their critical eyes, Van Doren was in awe of these great teachers and poets and writers of Western civilization. And he said that he had a deep humility uh, in their presence. And he said that the other thing, and uh, Robert Giroux, who some of you might know also, who was also a student of Van Doren's, he said Van Doren had a very clever technique in his class, and that was that he would pretend that you were his intellectual peer or equal. And when I mentioned that to my father, he said it's not true. He didn't pretend. He actually really believed that. And that's what was powerful about his teaching. So my father actually wrote a commentary on an Elizabethan uh, treatise on verse. And so I grew up uh, hearing, my, he memorized a lot of poetry. I grew up hearing uh, poetry and also just hearing his discussions about these things. But I didn't appreciate any of it until I had a great teacher. And that occurred in the Middle East, and he was from West Africa. And so it was very strange that this American young man from the West Coast, who had a father who was immersed in great literature, and he's one of the only people that I know, he, he actually read the 37 plays of Shakespeare every year like the Muslims do a khatam. And every time he would finish, he would start over again. 
But I learned to appreciate poetry hearing West Africans listen to poetry, recite poetry, and be moved by poetry. And particularly their expressions when they heard a line, and this is called tarab. The Arabs call it tarab when we get the word troubadour from that Arabic word. The troubadour is the one that makes you uh, delight in what he has to say or tell, his story. And the Arabs, if they're moved by poetry, uh, they're, they're moved with this tarab. And the way the Mauritanians, they're very expressive because they'll literally, it's almost like they, you stab them when they hear a really good line of poetry and they'll say, <clears throat> like that, literally just like that. See? And they'll make a move when they hear, <clears throat> they'll literally make a move. And initially I thought that this was kind of an affected type of thing. But after a while I realized that it wasn't. It was that they really were being moved by the poetry. And that obviously got me more and more interested in poetry. And then it forced me, when I came back to the States, to go back to my own tradition. So it's funny, and by my own tradition I mean my own, the civilization that I grew up in, which has a tradition of great poetry. And one of the things about poetry and I really believe that one of the reasons that poetry is no longer taught and if you've ever had a teacher that taught you poetry in any real way that would have been probably the most profound class or experience that you had but very few people are afforded uh, that extraordinary delight of having a great teacher most of us have to suffer uh, the mediocrity of passionless people teach words that emanated from the hearts of deeply passionate people because what poetry is about is passion and what's forbidden in the modern world is passion it's actually forbidden you can't be passionate about anything and woe unto you if you're passionate and if you think what's out there mimicking passion has anything to do with real passion, then you've been completely deluded. Really, completely deluded. And if you think that any of these politicians that seem to be passionate about what they're talking about, that is one of the greatest examples of the lie and the mimicry of what passion is about. One of the reasons that they don't teach poets anymore is because poets aren't melodramatic. And in a world that you want people to think in melodramatic terms, you don't want them to understand the subtleties of the poet. And I'll just give you an example from Western tradition. In Homer's The Iliad, you never know whether Homer the Greek is on the side of the Greeks or the Trojans. You don't know who's more noble, the Greeks or the Trojans. And he's telling you something about most wars that are fought between people. If you look at the wars that were fought between uh, the Muslims and the non-Muslims in that first part of Islam. The greatest warriors of the Quraysh, men like Khalid ibn al-Walid, who fought against the Prophet in so many battles, end up becoming one of the greatest warriors of Islam. Because it's not about this battle between black and white. It's about the living coming from the dead and the dead coming from the living. In Homer's Iliad, he has Achilles when his beloved is killed by Hector. And Achilles has a few flaws and one of them is wrath. 
He gets angry very easily and he's petulant. What Achilles does is he goes and he kills Hector and then he drags him around the tomb of his friend and then he leaves his body to be eaten by the dogs, which was a sacrilege to the Greeks and the Trojans, something terrible, no respect for the dead. And one of the things that Apollo says in a gathering, and Apollo was opposed to Achilles, he was on the side of the Trojans. Apollo says, woe unto Achilles, lest we become angry with him, and he is a good man. And what that tells you is that when you look at your enemy, you have to be willing to admit that even your enemy has redeeming qualities. Because if you're not willing to admit that, then you're stuck in this Manichaean duality of black versus white. And this is the melodrama of the modern world. They're evil, therefore we're good. And the problem with that world view, like uh, an American poet who was more noted for her doggerels than for her poetry, but I still like her, which is uh, Helen Wheeler Wilcox. She used to write a poem every day for one of the newspapers in the 1880s. She said that the world's divided into two people. And it's been said that the world is indeed divided into two people. Uh, one group are the group that divide the world into two people. And the other group is all the rest. <laughs> so she said that the world is divided into two people. And she said, and I'm not talking about the good and bad. Because the good are half bad and the bad are half good. That's the, the human condition. So that's, that's one of the things the poets teach that they don't want taught anymore because it makes people have to actually think. And thinking is problematic in a society where you don't want people to think. So what happened to poetry? That's a, that's a good question. What happened to English poetry? One of the things about the modern world is that they tell us that anybody can write poetry. This is what you'll learn in a creative writing class. That's the biggest lie anybody ever told you. You can just sit down and put down your thoughts and call that poetry. It's not poetry because this is another lie that this culture wants to teach is that hard things come easy. Fast food. Right? Just go to McDonald's. You can be satiated. And if you think that food satiates you, listen to your body after a few years of eating it. As the heart begins to harden. Literally and, and figuratively. It's not just literal hardening of the the arteries, arterial sclerosis. It's spiritual hardening of the heart. Eating food that has no blessing. Eating food that wasn't made with the, the, the hands of a loving person who actually cares for the people he or she is feeding. Right? Food sacrificed to the altar of God. There used to be something in this country they called soul food. Right? Soul food. That was the food that your mother cooked with love because it actually nourished your soul. It wasn't hamburgers made with beef that are fed other animals that give them diseases like mad cow's disease. It's not old McDonald's farm anymore. Right? What happened to old McDonald? He became McDonald's. And that's part of the problem. Really? So this, what happened to poetry? Well, I'll tell you what happened to poetry. The Qur'an has a chapter called the poets, a shu'ara. And there's no chapter in the Qur'an that isn't named after something that is great. 
You will not find any chapter in the Quran that is not named after something that has immense import. Whether it's the spider, whether it's the cow, whether it's the bee, whether it's the morning sunlight, whether it's the moon, whether it's the, the moving sand dunes, whether it's mutual consultation, every word that is used as a title for one of the chapters of Quran has immense import in the lives of human beings. And one of them is the poet. But the Quran divides the poets into two types of people. The poets who sell the gift that they have been given for the highest bidder. And this was the Jahili poet. He was called the Sha'ir. And what he would do is if you paid him enough money, he would say whatever you wanted to say. Whatever you wanted to say with him. And when I mentioned that to my father, about that in the Quran, he said it reminds me of Simenides that Aristotle mentioned. He was a poet, a Greek poet, that used to sell his ability to do verse to the highest bidder. And somebody once came to him and asked him to write a poem about a donkey that he had particular love for. And it bothered Simenides that he would have to write a poem about a donkey. But because the man was paying him enough money, he wrote the poem and Socrates quoted a couple of lines from it, How beautiful thou art, thou storm-footed ass. <laughs> so that's one type of poet. And whether you realize it or not, he is now disguised as an ad man. And the Quran says about these people is, the poets, they follow them, those who are astray. Haven't you seen them wandering in every valley, saying with their mouths what they don't do? So I want to give you a couple examples of that. All I did opened up a... Uh, magazine today, didn't even have to look very far, just open it up. For, first ad, Godiva chocolate will make her heart skip a beat. If she wins the ring, you may need to know CPR. <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question. Godiva chocolate will make her heart skip a beat. If she wins the ring, you may need to know CPR. Just next one. One part protection, one part complexion. <laughs> Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. One part protection, one part complexion. Estrostep, your pill for more reasons than one. <laughs> Make your bones rock hard. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace of time from day to day. Make your bones rock hard. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. The ancients would never do that. Even Simenides would not stoop that low. And that's the problem with our modern world, is that they don't know what words are. They don't know the power of words. They don't know who gave man words. They don't know where they came from. 
Elizabeth Browning did. And in fact, I think she gave one of the best descriptions of Jalaluddin Rumi. She wasn't talking about Rumi, but she was talking about a poet. He, bears, he bore by day, he bore by night that pressure of God's infinite on his finite soul. Right? I mean, that's, that's the poet. One part protection, one part complexion. Right? Chiquita banana. I'm Chiquita banana and I'm here to say a banana's got to ripe in a particular way. Right? The Quran says about language, Ar Rahman. علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان. The merciful who has taught the Quran created the human being and taught the human being how to articulate his needs, how to speak what was in his heart, speak what was in his heart. علمه البيان. The word in Arabic to speak what's in your heart is to Yu'ribu. In fact, that's what an Arab was. And that's why Herodotus said of all people, the Arabs hated the lie more than anything else. Herodotus said about the Arabs, of all people, the Arabs hated the lie more than any other people because they knew what words were. Words are meant to speak the truth. That's what words are for. And that's what the other type of poet does. He speaks the truth. And that's a very difficult thing in the modern world because like Mark Twain said, only dead men can speak the truth. Right? Now I want to just take a liar uh, as an example here. Uh, this is a book called Why I Am Not a Muslim. His name's Ibn Warraq. And it's interesting, he, uh, he says acknowledgments. And the first thing he acknowledges, I am not a scholar or a specialist. Well then what are you doing writing a book about Islam? I mean that's, that's an interesting question to ask somebody who's writing a book about Islam. But he says here, that there are three types of Islam. Islam 1, what is what the Prophet taught. Islam 2, what is expounded in the religion, interpreted and developed by theologians through traditions. It includes Sharia and Islamic law. And Islam 3, what Muslims actually did do and achieve, that is to say Islamic civilization. My general thesis emerges in this book is that Islam 3, i.e. Islamic civilization, often reached magnificent heights despite Islam 1 and 2. And here's the example he gives. In the Mishkats of the Prophet Muhammad, and this is revealing his ignorance because even though it's in the Mishkat, the hadith is from Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim and it's muttafaq alayh, which means it's agreed upon. It has one of the highest authorities in Islam. The Prophet Muhammad is made to say, a belly full of purulent matter is better than a belly full of poetry. That's the hadith. It's actually a true hadith. Had the poets adhered to Islam 1 and 2, we certainly would not have had the poems of Abu Nuwas singing the praises of wine and the beautiful buttocks of young boys. I mean, this is a very odd thing for Ibn Warraq to be uh, happy about. The poems about the buttocks of beautiful young boys uh, was preserved for posterity because the hadith wasn't uh, followed. In this culture they call it pedophilia, I think, if you write poems about uh, young boys' buttocks. But that's, that's for the FBI to deal with in Operation Candyman. <laughs> Maybe Abu Nawas would have been part of that sting operation. The, uh, the interesting thing about that hadith is what the Prophet was talking about 
is these type characters, one part protection, one part complexion. And most of you, unfortunately, have enough of these type of uh, lines, and many of you don't even know that they're actually in, uh, in metered uh, verse. And if you go through a lot of these so-called, uh, I mean, this is just lousy, it's, it's not very well done, but we're changing the face of security, protecting people, preserving privacy. Right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the poets that, that it's, it, it's better that you had uh, your, your belly filled with pus than that you fill it with empty words, right? And if you just look, because the world's filled with poetry and people love poetry, and that's why pop songs uh, are filling the airways is because people actually love to hear uh, metered words. They love to hear lyric verse. And so people listen to this music and they don't think about what their minds are being filled with. They don't think about, uh, we, we worry about uh, pollution of the environment, but people don't worry about pollution of the mind, about what actually goes into your ears and enters into your heart. Because the Quran says, that in the sama wal basar wal fu'ada kullu ulaika kanu anhum mas'ula, that your ears, your eyes and your heart, these you have been made responsible for. You're actually responsible to protect your heart so that your soul doesn't die because one of the ways the soul is killed is by allowing things into the soul that poison the soul. And one of the most powerful and toxic elements is words that are not true. False words. And this is the poetry that the Prophet Muhammad was warning about. His wife Aisha memorized 12,000 lines of poetry from the poet Labid alone. 12,000 lines. The Prophet Muhammad was once riding on a camel and he asked to hear some of the lines of one of the Jahadi poets, which was a pre Islamic poet, who his poetry was filled with wisdom. And the narrator says, I, I, said, I mentioned a line, and the Prophet said, he, he get, let's hear some more. And he said, I mentioned some more, and he said, he, he let's hear some more, until I mentioned a hundred lines of poetry. The Prophet ﷺ used to have poets in his gathering. His own Hassan ibn Thabit, who was uh, one of the great poets of that time, he said, this man's poetry is strengthened by the Holy Spirit. One time a man, Al-Aqra ibn Wahhabis, came to him and he was from Bani Tamim, who's a Najdi tribe. And he called from uh, behind the Prophet's house, he said, uh, Oh Muhammad وسلم, you better come out because I'm a poet and my praise is good and my blame is bad. And the Prophet وسلم, said, that's God. It's not you. That's God. The one, that, the, the one whose praise is good and whose blame is bad, that's God. So he said, come out, because we want to have the... The Arabs had these kind of poetic combat, where they would have one poet of one tribe would get up and oppose the poet of another tribe. And this was a civilized way of fighting. And sometimes it led to uncivilized ways of fighting. Because words meant something to those people. I and mean, that's part of the problem with modern people is words don't mean anything anymore. You can say anything and, and, and uh, you know, Dennis Miller, right? I mean, the, 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 these are the type of people that can get out there and just say anything. And, and part of this culture is that we've become such a shameless culture. And one of the things about shamelessness is the root of shamelessness is shame. And if you want that insight, you have to go to the great Russian poet, and he is a poet, even though he wrote in prose, uh, Dostoevsky. Because in his brother's Karamazov, if anybody who's read that remembers the meeting with the priest who was the mystic, and the father is a, he's a dabachi, he's, he, he, he's always having orgies in his houses, and he's, he's a terrible man. And he always behaves like a buffoon. Shameless. And he's in the presence of this uh, mystic, Father Zesimo, and he, said, he begins to act like a buffoon, and Ilyosha, who's trying to perfect his soul, 
is mortified, and his other son Ivan is mortified, and there's a point where he says, I'm, I'm so ashamed at behaving like this, and the priest says to him, don't be ashamed because that's the root of the problem. In other words, that's why you're so shameless, is because you're so filled with shame. And that's what's happened in this culture. This culture, we've become such a shameless culture that we have to be shameless in order to deal with the pain of being so shameless. So shameless. And that's something very difficult for us. So, that's the, that, that, those are the... Uh, those are the poets that the Prophet ﷺ warned about, not, not poets who had truth to say. So I want to look just at a few uh, things and then I'll stop because it's been a long night. Uh, one of the things that Borges, who's extraordinary, he wrote a wonderful story about, about a, a meeting between Ibn Rushd of Arawis and several other intellectuals. It's a beautiful story, it's a fictionized account of something that could have happened. And the beauty of the story for me is that what Borges was trying to do was trying to give us a glimpse of the exalted level of conversation that the people of Andalusia had. And they're discussing a line of poetry that comes out of the Mu'allaqat, which is, these are the, the great odes that the Arabs hung in the Kaaba before Islam, uh, and they were they considered them to be testimony to the greatness of the Arabic language, and they were they were they were great, but many of them were filled with meanings that Islam would radically transform. Uh, but they talk about this line of poetry in which the poet says, Zuhair says, that I, I saw death like the stumbling of a, a camel. The one that it hits, it destroys, and the one that it misses lives a long life and grows old. And they begin to argue about this line of poetry, and they say it's, it's a bad line because uh, fate is not like the stumbling of a camel. Uh, fate is determined by God. And Ibn Rushd or Averroes in the story says, no, you're wrong. Because what the poet describes is he describes something we can all relate to. And that's what makes poetry great, is the poet speaks in a universal language. And this is why Aristotle, and, he, and Averroes is the greatest commentator of Aristotle. And, and so Borges knew that, and Borges knew Aristotle very well. What Aristotle says is that poetry is greater than history, because history deals with particulars, but poetry deals with the universal. And that is why when the poet speaks, the poet impacts our hearts if he speaks the truth, because we recognize that truth in our hearts. And what Ibn Rushd says in this story, is that the poet, when he, what he says, he, he says fate is not like a stumbling camel, but he says, I see it like that. Ra'aytu. That's what he's describing. And what he's saying is that often when we look at the world, we see chaos. It doesn't mean that it's chaotic, but we often see only chaos. And that is what the poet is saying. He's describing something that human beings experience. And that's why when we look at the world today, when we look at human beings, we can often forget that there is an order in this universe. When we look at Palestine right now, and look at the madness that's taking place there, and Palestine is the meeting of two worlds. That's all Palestine is. If you want to understand Palestine, all you have to understand is that half of this planet, half of this planet lives on less than two dollars a day. And we in the West consume 60% of the world's resources 
even though we are less than 10% of the inhabitants of the planet. And where do those two civilizations meet? They meet in Palestine. Because Palestine is taking people from the West and planting them in the midst of a society that has been too long exploited and had its resources expropriated, lived under despotism, largely due to post-colonial traumatic syndrome, and most people are too busy watching the, the important messages from our sponsors to bother to actually read a book about the history of the Middle East, about colonialism. I mean, just read David Frompkin's A Peace to End All Peace, right? Most people are too busy to realize that most of what's going on in the West that's troubling us is what they call blowback in CIA parlance, blowback, the unsuspected consequences or unforeseen consequences of our own covert activities. Right? That's all it is. But people don't want, that's, that's troublesome. We, we want to be in melodrama, remember? Us versus them, good versus evil, the evil empire, the axis of evil, these wonderful terms that, that make life so easy. They're all bad, remember? And we're all good, thank God. Right? Makes it very easy instead of having to deal with these ambiguities, which is what the poets are trying to tell us. We've got problems, you have to think a little bit deeper. So that's what the poet has. He has a universal message. And that's what Rumi had, and I think that's why Rumi, Rumi strikes me as being popular for, for two reasons. One, he's, he's just, he's calling our bluff because everybody knows in their heart of hearts that they're going to die. And all he is is somebody who's in the moment recognizing that death is imminent and that the only important thing is the readiness. And that's something another great poet from the West said. If you look at the play Hamlet, which really is a play of spiritual evolution. A lot of people don't read Shakespeare like that, but Shakespeare actually was working within uh, deeply spiritual motifs. And I'm going to just use two examples and then I'm done. One of them is the idea of, of purifying the soul. And Hamlet, if you remember in the great soliloquy when he says to be or not to be, what's it about? It's about fear of death. That's what, that's what it's all about. It's about fear of death because that's part of Hamlet's dilemma is this fear of his own mortality. But by the end of the play, what's happened to the man? He's had a complete transformation and when he's about to go into this duel, Horatio, they're talking and he he hints to Horatio that even though he feels he's going to win the duel, he has this, this sense of his own death. And Horatio is worried about it and he says, we'll stop it for another time. And, and what does Hamlet say? He says, not a whit. We defy augury. Don't stop it. We're going to defy augury. In other words, having a bad omen. And this is something the Prophet Muhammad taught. He said, if you have a bad omen, do the thing anyway. Go against that, that thing in your soul. And then he says, there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. In other words, even God is aware of the fall of a sparrow. And there's, there's a providence in that fall. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. He's talking about death. It's nothing you can stop. If it's meant to be now, it's not coming later. If it's coming later, it's not meant to come now. And then he says, the readiness is all. 
That's what life is about. It's, it's not trying to put off death. It's being ready for death. Since no man has aught of what he leaves, what is it to leave betimes? Let be. If you can't take anything with you, then why are you so worried about living this long life? Because once death comes, and this is said by many, many great people before him and after him, Marcus Aurelius was one of them. And finally, my favorite sonnet, and I'm sorry if you came to hear Rumi, I'm quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> but they call Shakespeare the Rumi of the... No, they call Rumi the Shakespeare of the East, which is... That's, that's not... Shakespeare is Shakespeare, Rumi is Rumi. So, I'll try to compare them. But this is a great... Uh, this is a great sonnet. I th it's actually my favorite, but... Everybody's, my father says his favorite's the one he happens to be reading at the time. So. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action until action lust. Is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight, past reason hunted, and no sooner had past reason hated as a swallowed bait, on purpose laid to make the taker mad, mad in pursuit and in possession so, had having an inquest to have extreme, a bliss in proof, and proved a very woe, before a joy proposed, behind a dream. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well, to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. And that is a commentary on a hadith. Huffat al-nar bil-shahawat wa huffat al-jannah bil-makarih. That hell is surrounded by pleasurable things and heaven is surrounded by displeasurable things. That's all he's saying is that you look at uh, the, the enticements of this world and you go after them without any thinking and as soon as you've got them you realize the bitterness of their reality they didn't get you what you wanted and he says we all know it because we've done it again and again and again and yet we don't know to shun the heaven that leads to hell in other words, these temporary pleasures that end up leading us uh, to something that is frightening. And, and this is one of the, the truths that the poet said and the Prophet ﷺ said, in the minashi'ri la hikmah, surely in poetry is great wisdom. Ibn Hajar says, ay qawlan sadiqan yutabiq al haq A true word that is in accordance with the truth. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Astaqu ma qala sha'ir, the truest thing that a poet ever said was what Labid said, Ala kullu shay'in ma khalallaha batilu. Isn't it that everything other than God is falsehood? And that's in Sahih al Bukhari. And that's all Rumi ever said. You can read all those lines, words, words, words. That's all his message is. It's just a commentary on that one statement of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Everything other than God is false. And if you realize that at the intellectual level, he and every other uh, scholar of Islam has been calling us to realize it at, a, at an experiential level. And that's the path of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which in Arabic is called Al-Islam. Submission to God. And I'm going to finish with, I tricked you, I'm going to finish with a poem by Jalaluddin al-Rumi, which is in, uh, translated by Coleman Barks, who I, I like Coleman a lot, um, but my friend Muhammad Isa Waili said his translations are too Rumi for me. Right? R-O-O. -O. <laughs> uh, this is called One Who Wraps Himself and it's a commentary on a chapter in the Qur'an, Muzammil. <laughs> 
God called the Prophet Muhammad Muzammad the one who wraps himself and said come out from under your cloak you so fond of concealment and fleeing because the Prophet loved to go off to the cave and meditate and so he's being told now to, to come back don't cover your face. The world is a reeling, drunken body and you are its intelligent head. Don't hide the candle of your clarity. Stand up and burn through the night, my prince. Without your light, a great lion is held captive by a rabbit. Right. That's what uh, uh, Odysseus in one of Shakespeare's plays says to the Greeks. Uh, it's not by, it is by our weakness that Troy stands, not by their strength. And, and that's, that's the reality. It's by the weakness of the people of truth that the people of falsehood stand, not by their strength. Because falsehood has no strength. But when the people of truth are weak, then a, ra a rabbit uh, can hold a lion captive. Be the captain of the ship, Mustafa, my chosen one, my expert guide. Look how the caravan of civilization has been ambushed. Fools are everywhere in charge. <laughs> it's not a lot has changed. Right? Do not practice solitude like Jesus. Be in the assembly and take charge of it. So you should live most naturally out in public and be a communal teacher of souls. Alhamdulillah, uh, I thank my uh, teachers uh, for instilling me in me uh, a love that, of poetry that my father tried to instill in me. And uh, I thank uh, all of you for bearing with me tonight and being very patient and polite. I would actually say that that's not true. That Islam is in fact a very Western religion. Uh, it, is, it is in many ways as Western as Christianity because Christianity, the cradle of Christianity, is also the Middle East. And uh, we know that Jesus, peace be upon him, walked the earth uh, in the same area that uh, many, many of the prophets that we know about and that we share for those of you who are Christian and also for those of you uh, who might be Jewish, uh, we actually share uh, as people many of the same prophets. In fact, people who read the Quran are often very surprised to find uh, that many of the prophets that are mentioned in the Old Testament are also mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Joseph is, uh, an entire chapter is dedicated to the prophet Joseph. And also uh, we have uh, Noah and we have uh, Abraham and we have Solomon and David. Uh, these are all names that you'll uh, see mentioned in the Quran and their stories.